Hello, everyone. We are here again with the new EICHM chat and have the pleasure today to welcome Claudio Sandroni for the Ospedale, Ospedale Gemelli in Rome. Claudio is a worldwide expert in pronunciation after cardiac arrest, which will be our topic today. Hi, Claudio. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here, Fabio. So my pleasure. Claudio, you have been uh, uh, reviewing extensively the literature on pronunciation of patients suffering from post-anopsic injury. The first question is, why is clinical examination so difficult to implement as the main uh, way to assess prognosis in these patients? Yeah, well, that's, that's an excellent question, Fabio. So the main reason is that uh, up to now, at least, patients are heavily sedated after cardiac arrest, especially in the first 48 to 20, 72 hours in order to control the temperature. And there is evidence showing that the effects of these sedatives and sometimes muscle relaxing agents uh, is uh, long lasted and uh, it can uh, be still there for two or three days. So there is a huge risk of uh, confounding from sedation. And so although the clinical examination is very important, is, is, is the entry point of the currently recommended algorithm for prognostication, there is always a risk for interference, especially in the first two days after recovery of spontaneous circulation or ROSC. Which are the uh, non-clinical non tools we can use in the setting to try to assess neurological function in these patients? Mm -hmm. Oh, we have several uh, um, investigations we can use. The first is biomarkers. The most widely used of them is the neuron-specific annulase or NSC. The second one is EEG. Then we have some of the sensory evoke potential, the short latency ones from the upper limb. And finally, we have imaging. Another component of clinical examination is uh, myoclonus. So, Claudio, one of the things that has been highlighted in the guidelines is that all these tools should be used, let's say, a day three, day four after arrest to assess prognosis. But one of the things that some, some physician missed as an information that we start to collect the data very early after ICU admission. Indeed. So, which are the way that you uh, manage, which is the first test you ask for the first day, which, which test you ask at the second or third day, how you manage the time course of those? Yes, the, this is also an excellent question, Fabio. So although the prognostic balance is made not earlier than 72 hours after cardiac arrest, during the first 72 hours, we collect a series of information, including a daily clinical examination, biomarkers, if you have them, electroencephalogram, which has a double uh, use, usefulness because it's not only useful for prognostication, but it also allows you to assess the status of the brain to rule, out, to rule out the seizures, which are very important and potentially have are a potential cause of deterioration of uh, outcome of patients. So they may need to be treated. And we also evaluate imaging. Some predictors like brain CT can be collected as early as uh, 24 hours after cardiac arrest. So we don't just wait until 72 hours, but we actively collect data during all this period and after the effects of sedation and muscular relaxants is out, we evaluate the patient. And if the patient is still comatose, therefore we put uh, all together the information we collected during the first three days and we produce a prognostic balance. Can you uh, remind to the audience, uh, which is the very recent uh, recommendation for prognostication of poor neurological outcome that you have co-authored with the ERC-ASIC guidelines? So the current guidelines, which have been published in April this year, recommend that the poor prognosis is predicted when two of six predictors are present. And these predictors include no pupillary or corneal reflexes at 72 hours or later after arrest, a bilaterally absent N20 cortical wave of some of the sensory evoked potentials, a highly malignant EEG, neuron-specific cannulase above 60 micrograms per liter on the second or the third day after ROSC, a status myoclonus during the first three days, and signs of diffuse and extensive anoxic injury 
on either brain CT or MRI or magnetic resonance imaging? Of course, the guidelines try to summarize the evidence, but then the issue is the implementation, what people can do, let's say, everywhere in all the hospitals, because not all the centers have all the six predictors available. So my question is, which is the most used one in clinical practice in surveys? And if you can choose one, let's say your preferred tool, which is the one you would recommend to have at least in every centers when you assess prognosis in these patients? Well, yes. So previous reviews, uh, the most extensive one has been made uh, rather a few times, uh, yes, the six or seven years ago, showed that the most widely used were EEG and imaging. Well, the second result is pretty strange because I suspect that not many people have sufficient skill to use imaging effectively, especially brain CT. But EEG is extremely useful, is available almost everywhere. And uh, I would recommend it, it's used for prognostication as long as the assessment of the EEG uses standardized methodology and terminology. That was a big issue in 2015 where the use of EEG was not particularly encouraged because when we reviewed the evidence before 2015, so uh, up to 2013, 2014, uh, the vast majority of studies had very heterogeneous definition of malignant EEG. But after the 2012, the, most of the studies uh, aligned with recommended uh, terminology from the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society for using clinical care and now when we reviewed again the evidence for these 2021 guidelines, most of the studies use a consistent definition. And now we have a definition of malignant EGs and the two most predictive patterns are suppression and bar suppression. They have consistent definition. In other words, suppression is no activity above 10 microvolts, while suppression is nothing else than suppression plus bars. This is pretty easy. So as long as you use consistent definitions, AG can be used for confidence. Another tool I would recommend to use is absence of pupillary reflex. There is a, a potential for confounding from sedation, but if you use a, a quantitative pupillometry, this can also be extremely useful and uh, made at bedside and can be very accurate early, much earlier than expected. There is one point that is important, again, to remind to the people that listen to us, to the many people I hope that listen to us, is that what has been changing in the legal guidelines, that in 2014 and 15, we had at least one predictor who could be sufficient to mm -hmm. identify patients with a poor outcome, very likely. Now, we recommend this concordance of signs, which is the reasons why we recommended this. Why is not only one sufficient to say, uh, you know, the neurological injuries to extend. Yeah, when we reviewed the evidence in uh, 2020, uh, in order to inform the 2021 guidelines, we included 94 studies that were published in just eight years, it was a boom in the recent years in, uh, from, from in prognostication studies. And we saw two things. The first one is the one you mentioned before, some of these predictors are not implemented in the perfect way. So even very robust predictors are like SSCPs, even in expert hands can someone sometime yield falsely pessimistic prediction because they are not implemented very well. And the second reason is that there is a, a risk of self-fulfilling prophecy because in part, but not all fortunately of these studies, the same predictors of poor outcome that were assessed in the study were also used for prediction of poor neurological outcome in clinical practice. And so they were used as criteria for withdrawal or life sustaining therapy. So there was a risk of self-fulfilling prophecy. And so there was a risk that the accuracy of these predictors was uh, overestimated. And that's why we became more prudent Actually, the 2015 guidelines recommended a combination of predictors for most of them, but for some of them, like some of the sensory dot potentials, as a matter of fact, they allowed prediction based on just one predictor. But now, now we know that this is not the most prudent way to go. And that's why we recommended at least two concordant predictors of poor neurological outcome. 
Of course, the details of everything we said is uh, published in intensive care medicine as a new guidelines. So yeah. for details, people can read. I have a last question for you because we are talking on prognostication of poor outcomes since now many years. Like, of course, if everyone was expecting poor outcome, but sometimes in practice it would be nice to have predictors of good outcome because that could be maybe used to say, let's keep aggressive therapies. There is a, a possibility to recover. So what is, in your opinion, in the next future, do we have anything that could, could help us? And maybe in one, in one future um, period will be a standardized written as a new algorithm. Do we have tools that can help to identify patients with a high probability or neurological recovery? Yeah, I agree, Fabio. That will be, this is a very important issue and that will be very good. It will be great if we will have available predictors of good neurological outcomes. So prediction of good neurological outcome is just mentioned briefly in the current guidelines. So it put an asterisk uh, warning that if signs of poor neurological outcome coexist with signs that uh, indicate that a good neurological recovery is possible, we have to reassess the patient and if needed, repeat the assessment because there's the risk that you are facing a, a falsely pessimistic prediction. But this is just an expert opinion. This is not based on a, on a systematic review. And, uh, but these predictors exist. They are mentioned in the guidelines and they can include uh, normal levels of biomarkers or normal brain MRI, uh, uh, favorable EG, and they have been systematic re review just now. We just completed a systematic review of predictors of good neurological outcome, and its results have been submitted in, to a journal, and we, they will hopefully publish very soon and inform the future guidelines. So we can hope in the next future to have maybe a, even a little, a little bit more complicated algorithm, but with a few possibility also to identify patients with Indeed. good outcome. So Claudio, of course, thanks a lot because your expertise is very uh, fruitful and important for everyone, for everything that you've done in this area. And uh, I hope again uh, to see you in the one of our next EasyChem chat. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Fabio.